But yeah, it's one fewer car to have to worry about. Okay. And it's my shoe has a big honor of welcoming you all. My name is Carol Minkiti, and I was, I'm was i the wife of Ifani Minkiti, who passed away a little over three years ago, or two years ago, I guess. And now my children and I own the store, and we are very proud of it, and we're very proud of uh, James, our manager, mm -hmm. and we're proud of Naimi, Naima, she's a volunteer actually, who's just joined us and she's volunteering her work in the store. So we feel very fortunate to have such support by people, you know, who really love the store as much as we do. <laughs> and like I always say, and my husband always said that it was a sacred place. He loved this store very, very much and felt that poetry was the answer to a lot of problems in the world. Mm -hmm. So there's poetry from all over the world here. So mm -hmm. thank you for being here. And I know you'll enjoy this part reading tonight. It's mm -hmm. wonderful people here. Thank you. And a welcome to the people on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Mm Thank you all so much. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the poets who we have here today. So Mary Bookinger is the author of Clouds, published in 2021, Ein Fulung in Feeling, published in 2018, Aerialist, published 2015, and her collection Virology is forthcoming. Her work has appeared in Agni, Gargoyle, Interim, Massachusetts Review, Pank, Phoebe, Plume, Queen Mob's Tea House, and elsewhere. President of the New England Poetry Club, she teaches at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Boston. Marcia Karp's If By Song was published by Lily Poetry Review Books in 2021. She has published poems and translations in journals and anthologies in England and America, including the Times Literary Supplement, Harvard Review, The Guardian, Partisan Review, The Word Exchange, Anglo-Saxon Poems and Translation published by Norton, and joining music with reason, 34 poets, British and American, Oxford, 2004 to 2009, published by Waitwiser. She taught literary and editorial matters at Boston University after earning graduate degrees there. Adam Kirsch is a poet and critic whose writing appears regularly in The New Yorker and other publications. The Discarded Life is his fourth collection of poetry, and he is the author of several books of criticism and biography. An editor at the Wall Street Journal, he lives in New York City. Um, so before we hear from these poets, I'd just like to ask everybody to silence their cell phones and enjoy. Really exciting to be here. Thank you for coming out. Um, so I am... Okay, so I'm starting with a poem called Stranger, because I don't know everyone here. <laughs> so this is a kind of, um, you know, a welcome. Before I do that, though, I really want to thank James and the Grillier. Um, it's just, you know, it's inspiring to be here in this space. So thank you for that. Thank you to all who are here. Um, so I'm so the poem called Stranger. Can everyone hear me? Okay, okay, good. <clears throat> Stranger. I love the forest of you. How dark it is and bewildering. In you, wolves, mushrooms, spiders, moss, trillium, scat branches to climb and to break into kindling. The danger of you is me 
searching. Sweep the sky, O oh, long needled pine. Bow low to my fireweed. Open into a silver glade where I can savor the respect of tall inhabited grasses, the nods of turning nomad leaves. <clears throat> and then I'd like to read a poem from my most recent book, which is in the window. Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. um, derivation. Um, I, you know, I love to think about where things come from. And so derivation, words, etymology. Um, derivation is kind of about that. <clears throat> derivation. A daily ration. Whence cometh? Watershed. Meadow and muck. Begotten, not made. Testament of continuance. Pocked and riven with scars and fissures. Purposeful foreplay. Font of significance. Prone to flood. Whither thou goest. Runnels of sweat on the delta of a bra. Endless movement, movement away, pleated skirt. Whereas Genesis, etc. <clears throat> and then I want to read title poem from Aerialist. Um, I have such fond memories of being here when this book came out because it was launched here in this space. And believe it or not, standing room only, it was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Carol and Ifyani were so gracious. Um, so I'm going to read the title poem. Um, and this is, the, this is a true story. Red line is fun, right? So aerialist in the subway car. She rises from her seat beside me, loosens the stanzas of her spine, and composes faith from the gray everyday hand straps above our heads, meant for the standing only. Arms summoning a choir of muscle. She draws herself up into a hymn I've always dreamt of singing and dangles upside down like a whole note inches from the lit ceiling that has never before looked so habitable. <laughs> Her torso sways, measures time as the rest of us forget breath. Then this cleft of a woman unfurls and returns to sit like one who would not consider calling into question the dogma of the commute. Having just taught us all to pray, she faces straight ahead, closes her eyes, and the air fills with a hum of this too is possible. And oh, may we all be held upright, firm in devotion to our art. So um, I'm just going to read one more poem, but it's a long one. <laughs> it's a sequence. Um, and it's new. It's called St. John of the Cross um, and the Buried Flower. And I first learned about St. John of the Cross here in the Grolier, talking with Elizabeth Dor Doran, who's right there. Um, jo St. John was a mystic poet uh, in the 1500s. And he wrote about the dark night of the soul. And um, in this poem, there's some quotations from uh, translation and notes by John Frederick Mims. Um, and I'll indicate these with my hands. <clears throat> St. 
St. John of the Cross and the Buried Flower. The bulb was half buried, half bared to the sun, gnawed by animals. Its flower grew into the earth like a brain into a skull, clumped and cramped. The crowd of waxy petals pushed out walls, made a chamber of the dark. Another day, another baby born beneath the besieged city of Kiev. You will grow underground is what you will do. St. John of the Cross praised the dark cloth of night that saved him. God is a dark night to man in this life. It's a kind of making do, the plant flourishing within its constraints. What does it do to say, if only I'd been perfectly planted in optimal soil. You must imagine how it appeared from above. Picture a winter swept spring garden after the snowdrops and crocus, some early flocks and daffodils, a new purple hyacinth. Each morning, I examined my little urban plot with its bare-boned peach tree and stranded foundation rock. I watched for beauty and surprise, a partner with earth, eager for what would emerge. And when I first noticed the bulb, crusty, rusty, yellow, red, brown, scraped by squirrel teeth. I was certain it was dead, but I poured a handful of dirt on top so it wouldn't burn in the spring sun. Soon a fat ribbon of green crossed the dirt beside it, humped up like a coiled fist. And I waited and waited for it to pop open not wanting to disturb what was issuing forth, I trusted its drive to meet the sun. A well-known poet said to me, I don't know what I would have done if my son had wanted to be a poet. Give it up, I guess, and not write poetry. Could you do that? I asked. If a man wishes to be sure of the road he's traveling on, then he must close his eyes and travel in the dark. A friend of mine met a man online. They played Scrabble together and chatted in boxes now speak on the phone across time zones, nights and nights of revelation. Yes, he's a scammer. He admits he's looking for money. She knows this, vows she will redeem him. Oh, heart in the darkness, how little you need how much you want. When I ask my grown sons if they want their childhood toys, they answer, we don't need them. I say want is different from need. The flower needs water and light. The flower wants nothing. Myself, I am a sack of want, mm -hmm. a living body of need. I keep looking for the word that in the beginning was, the word 
that can stoke and stroke a life that is. St. John was kidnapped and dragged off to the priory at Toledo. There he was shut in a gloomy, ill-smelling little closet, half starved, permitted no change of his flea-ridden clothing for eight months, and beaten by his unreformed brethren at frequent intervals with such zeal that his shoulders were crippled for life. I know a man who loved his wife. When she died, he loved her even more. Each day he meditates on her. And now he says he knows her better in death than in life. With ropes twisted from strips of blanket and tunic, St. John let himself down from a dizzy height into the darkness. Somehow, after a stunning fall and mysterious assistance over a wall too high to climb, he found his way through the blackness of a strange city. I waited for the green to find its way up, to spread toward the sun, a vertical leap I depend on. I imagined it was a matter of time, that the sky is irresistible for the growing thing. All my life, roots have gone down and flowers have reached for the sun. But the days and the nights were seemingly one for this thing caged in the earth. Buried flower, you sought passages, forged them through your fuse. You fashioned a pale life with a rump of leaf bared to the sun. The tiny field of unburied green was enough. I heard a boy on the radio say, I want to believe both. I want both to be true. Meaning his beloved science teacher with facts and graphs, his document of changes in the climate and his parents in denial saying, go to school, but don't trust what they tell you. The boy had seen the forest fire sweep his town away. An act of God or an act of humans? I want to believe both, he said. I want both to be true. Rooting her feet like a warrior and reaching her arms into the sky, the instructor said, unify opposing forces. Feel how they stretch you, balance within them. Faith is a dark night for man, but in this very way, it gives him light. A friend observed, here in the US, we are writing poems about war, while poets under siege in Ukraine write love poems. St. John said, yearning needs to hurt in order to be worthy of the word. Otherwise, it is just wanting. Google says there are subterranean flowers. Mycoheterotrophs spend their entire lives underground. They've done away with photosynthesis altogether, having lost their leaves and chlorophyll. They parasitize fungi, which grow in symbiotic relationships with above ground plants, exchanging water and nutrients for food. The green fuse of the mycoheterotrophs foundered, yet it found a way. Is this a kind of living through books and movies? A life lived on the life of others? 
St. John was taken in, looking like an image of death and given pears stewed with cinnamon. With the sharp metal tongue of my trowel, I break the surface and cut a circle around the bulb and its green to extract it like a tumor. I will unfurl the fist of leaves, I think, so they can be something in the world. And that is when I discover the underground bouquet. Pale, sickly bundle, huddled in a shallow grave, growing like nails and hair from something unnurtured. How it festered below, knowing something but not enough how it tried to thrive, managing the dark. While the force pushed through its fuse, so it burst and rooted and leaved and flowered in a cave of its making, its glorious mark etched on the walls. The very day of his escape, St. John dictated some verses he had composed in prison but had been unable to write down. What is the word for what emerges? The unintentional, inevitable, the undeniable. The durable flowers cupped the dirt that held them. Only his final illness saved St. John of the Cross from further persecution in September, 1591. He was brought low with fever and terrible ulcers, these proving uncontrollable. On December 14th of that year, he died, his voice rising from the rotted flesh in delight at the beauties of the Song of Songs. I transplanted the bulb roots down into a proper pocket of rich, wet dirt and spread its leaves and flowers like a mantle on Earth's surface, where they lay spineless and blanched, separated from their night, expiring hour by hour beneath the strange and powerful Sun. So I'm taking our folks. <laughs> <laughs> so I too would like to thank Jim and Carol, whom I've just met, but she doesn't know that I um, have gratitude towards her and her family for quite some time. And um, Naima, who introduced me to myself, thank you. Um, enmity. The sculptor does not contend with the word nor the poet hate the stone, but the pit within each word, oh that, may I have the stomach to corrode. They are not us, nor we them. As if we hadn't wanted for ourselves their special gifts, as if defiance were not in their falls, they walk off branches on, then off, upon, then boom, they drop, then walk upon our ground. They laugh, cheep, cheep, at our green eyes. As if a magic hand sluiced round and touched each one of them, a touch, please, please, we each want aimed at us. They up, wheel, gather, fly, bye-bye from us who lumber in our jealous flight machines. Then some of us are providence and some boom of us provender. Thank you. 
what is left? We think it is new. We are so, so afraid. We think there has never been, ever been a thing like our thing. So we are so afraid. Just think, a village rapes a girl, a village burns a man. Here is the maelstrom, here is the horror. People we like are like people we don't. It is our turn to live it and not know what hit us. It is our turn for mayhem that droppeth as rain. It is our turn to cry we are virtue's last bastion while mayhem and help us turn us into them. She is 12 and they rape that girl over and over. That collar of tire, which then becomes fire, is fitted by many hands to one neck. Nobody taught us, we know how to do it. We shout and we leap for our lives to some standing. It is you, no, not I, yes. And no, 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 help us. We say that that thing is loosed from another town over. Oh, tut, tut, just think. It is ours and is us. What is left for our thing when havocs and swing? All against all, first among none. What better than words put in the ear at close range? You said, close friends who for some time were cold while we hugged. I remember when the trees were dead and this was just a dream. You said you'd begun to remember enough of me to miss me, a close friend once, now in the cold. Bring me in out of, I know I meant to say. Then I awoke and found it has stayed with me. You saying those words I put in your mouth in that hug of conspiracy I made up for us. All week, those who want to and can have brought to this winter wrapped road, men in machines bringing bare trees to ground and grinding the hidden green pulse to dust. I'd be your friend again in a minute if you would remember and miss me and tell me you do. Not the world, but some part of it. When I scoured for love some part of the world for arms to launch myself into, I kept my raid to myself or blabbed without cease, mongrel me, who could feel here is one whom after I'll run and never did know which me might be me the next moment. You love of my life, have we met and where and when? Was that you with the blue eyes and blonde who'd left women aside? Or you who fat old baldy still cried after a talk with the mother still cruel, then turned your venom on me. You with whom I tended the mad, or you more orphan, more surely yourself than me. I never have soured on love, the new lost grown out of, there is world yet and time, yet enough. I won't mind it then. I won't mind it if at the last I overhear in the room, will you, do you think, get another Marsha when this one is? Because no matter the quiet, or the not now, can't you see, that follows. I would then be someone 
with someone who loves me enough to want in the moment if appetite returns, that then, just then in mid-hum, I would die. So we'd both, I'd be part of a both, be sorry I was dead, not wrung out of sorrow by the diapering, slobbering, givering mess of the long overdue. Sentence. She told me I'd said this, brew has shoe on, as my first sentence. In all of the time since she told me, only just slow as I am, has it come to me now that she probably then and throughout those years they had fed me the words. His little shoe is on his piggies. Our little boy blue is here at home. One day the feet he wears will take him. Wave, bye bye, Brucey. Bye bye, shoe. When one day came, it took a year to know it. We were stymied each then in our going on anymore. And by and by slow as if we'd read the story how we waved each our lives they're living. Catastrophe. Here I have been out penelope Penelope, though not a husband, yet a brother, and I've 35 years to her 20, no suitors, and about my life the loose ends fray. On the weekend, the last of us, me, was reading in the sunshine from his schoolboy copy as Odysseus makes himself known bit by bit. From the right, not an eagle from Zeus, but a ladybug traveling bug far from her home, rifles the pages ahead, flies from me, taking the shape of the wind. Penelope questions the stranger. He is tricked into the tail of the bedpost. She knows him, hurrah. And then grief, and I quote, Penelope speaks, think what difficulty the gods gave. They denied us life together in our prime and flowering years, kept us from crossing into age together. In his schoolboy pen, he'd marked just the sixth mark in the book, these lines. He'd bracketed the four together as well as the inside two, those twice. I had to turn my face from Ithaca and marvel at this, a sign, the first through all these years that he'd know of our cowls of sorrow and knowing would not have bid us wear them. And so he is dead, dead decades ago, could not have let us suffer. Had the gods not been rinsed from our world long ago, it might have been Wayfinder Hermes and Ladybug Sandals marking that passage while feasts turned to massacre under my eyes. But the boy marked the passage and he is dead now I know. Son of once adamant mother, self-abjected father. They never bewailed at his bier, nor I. Or you, oh, my brother, made hidden farewell on the margins of our fortune, content your passage craftily marked our lives clanging upon us. The keys and my mother. He cares my father for everything and I am to care so too. I laugh at his caring, 
and I am a cause for his care. I learn to care as he does, and I am a case under care. Ending his cares, he left the hedges cut and the keys and my mother to me. Us out. I've all but given up, you know, shut it down all but completely. I didn't shut the running motor. It's not right that you weren't there. I'm the girl and I'm the youngest. Where were you to tear the bag that really killed him, not the car? Shut my mouth and shut my wanting, shut behind polite and mustn't. I could have shut her off and didn't. I kept her as a tended nightmare. She kept coins because you had. Someone paid for, wiped her off. Shut out love because I loved you. Shut off growth because, who knows? He must have been something to win her then when she was a glorious girl and he wasn't yet our sad raging father. Where were you? when I lost his body to science or garbage. I don't know where it went. Where were, when you shut the door, you, when you shut us out? Excuse me. what you did for my father 10 and then 20 years after. Oh, they would have been proud of you had they seen this, your home and its yard. So you weren't the genius you once seemed you might be and you were ever the odd man out, no matter with whom. Yet what a life you made and part made for me in our green yard and its home for us four. Millenniums of wants laid wall to wall. We had color and shade in the yard. Attached was a one car garage so secure, no harm could leave it and enter the house or anyone racing through it to find you. Unless it was harm to make me stand then outside, stupidly smashing windows. As if the ancient miasma you'd summoned were only mists of time to be dispersed. And so then you restored by the yet still vital air of that day. The house in repair. You trained me well. When I first moved back, I still felt like a guest in your house. I hired the man you'd hired and he kept up the lawn much as he'd kept it for you. He cut those last chance hedges twice a summer. Slowly, I changed things. I painted the house first in pinks and now in a spectrum of orange and brown with the roof the same. A banker who'd cared that you died told me the roof was a worry to you. But I took my time and am glad with the old bricking in front, the hole set into the green that she'd planted around us. It's warm and itself and now mine, your house. I chose beautiful paper for the walls, which was hung only half right. I had to buy a new dryer and did. My first repair was just after the day to the last hope glass I'd smashed with a rock, not knowing you put on a bag once the hedges were done. I'm a PhD now and the work is so sparse that I cut the lawn and try to the hedges now over my head and my reach. Ever since the dryer sparked out in a flood, I've hung the washing across the basement. The new sump pump pumps hard 
and the window it drains through is patched with some tiling I can almost place from before. Something happened during the painting. The windows now mustn't be opened. The old casement cranks barely work anymore. It's not what you would have fussed over, not paint on the to and fro arms or to thick at the edges, but as if once I'd got it burnished, the house as I'd done years ago to my peril in its passing to me shuddered so as to hold in all of the air that sang once out from you. Now I lay me over and over and over. Baby comes to take on the ogre. She tries the mountain that she dreamt when on rubber sheets she slept. Baby in her big girl bed held the dream as if it said, not fear of something being there, but fear of no one ever near feared baby. Though not yet knowing life got lived, it was as if she dreamt a gift of future must. Poor the baby, could she know how a thing not yet would go? It stayed as truth that dreamt of climb, and then she learnt that life was time and tried to think she was not meant to be nor was an isolate. Ogre, ogre, life's near over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much to Gorlier for having me. I was saying and thinking earlier that I've been coming here since the early 90s, and uh, it's always really exciting to, to be able to read here and, and to see everyone. So um, thank you all for coming in person and for, for tuning in online. Um, this is my new book, The Discarded Life, just published yesterday, in fact. Yes, wow. it was yesterday. And um, it is a book of poems about childhood and about um, my childhood growing up in Los Angeles in the 80s and 90s. And um, so it's got a lot of, of Gen X material in it. If you're familiar with any Gen X landmarks, um, events and, and some people and things, uh, they appear in the book and also a lot of LA specific stuff. Um, so I'm gonna read some of these poems and maybe I'll talk a little bit about some of these events as well. Um, sorry. So this is a poem about my elementary school, which was called the Wildwood School. And this was in the uh, very early 80s. And there was still a sort of a hippie-ish vibe there. Uh, it was not that far removed from the 60s that um, there was some leftover. 60s there and that was sort of how I first got to know a lot of these things um, which I then later realized oh this was a, a 60s culture that was lived on in this school. The last fumes of the 60s lingered on inside the prefab walls of Wildwood School where posters urging yes on ERA beamed <laughs> cheerfully as children bearing names like Bodhi, Star, and Rainbow shuffled in to start the day with union marching songs and chanties praising the endangered whales. If even here we knew about aggression, if boys loved breaking one another's arms and wrestling matches on the asphalt yard, a cast or two per classroom was the norm. And one, the most ingenious, ran a scam convincing me that if I didn't hand my Star Wars action figures over, he would find and kill my parents, <laughs> which I did for weeks in fear of his omnipotence. The fault was not the teachers, whom we knew by first name only. No one ever scrawled it on the tabula rasa of our minds. We must have brought it with us like a lunchbox. 
Conveniently, I can't remember what I did or said or who the victim was. This the time the teacher brought us face to face and coaxed me gently to apologize. All I remember is the liberation of realizing that I didn't need to mean it when I said that I was sorry. That I could feel resentment, not remorse, and no one else would know it. What I learned of Hopi customs and Kachina dolls lies like the school itself in disrepair, except for that day's inadvertent lesson. Good is what we have to seem to be, not something anybody ever is. In the 1980s, there was a lot, it was still the Cold War and uh, growing up at that time, there was a lot of uh, entertainment about nuclear war. And uh, it, was, it was sort of how people of my generation were educated about this idea that the world could end at any moment. Um, it was quite terrifying and, and although that's still, of course, possible and all those weapons still exist, I think it's not something that people think or talk as much about um, as they once did. This is a poem about, about some of those memories. A missile with Cyrillic characters hung in the air above Los Angeles, seconds from consummating what I knew was coming long before I saw the show, the color remake of The Twilight Zone, an episode I dreamed about for years. A woman had the power to make time stop, though she could never start it up again now that the warhead was about to hit. We lived inside that moment of delay, knowing the impact couldn't be avoided. In war games, the day after, on the beach, we gave ourselves a foretaste of extinction, its sweet dread and acidic vertigo. I hoped that it would come while I was sleeping, a flash, and then before I had a chance to notice that the sun was up at night, the shockwave that would turn me into ash, a prone stain on a wall or comforter, like in the photographs from Hiroshima. From time to time, a child would make the news for writing letters to the president, explaining that she wanted to grow up, begging him not to end the world too soon. How could he make her understand that no one, not Reagan nor Amdrapa, was in charge of all the bristling Mervs and Minutemen? They were the servants of a deeper logic, which says that everything that is potential comes to be actual eventually, and everything that has to happen happens. It's strange to think it hasn't happened yet. This is a, an event that everyone will re remember when they heard about it, especially if it was uh, something you were called out of a class in school to hear about. School is a place where nothing's meant to happen, which made that morning's bulletin historic for being broadcast right inside the classroom. They must have thought us old enough to learn that history is something going wrong. The shuttle torn into a Y of smoke while Houston kept on sending messages as though they couldn't see what we were seeing. At the assembly where the principal informed us what was natural to feel, the jokes began already. What did Krista say to her husband just before the lunch? The launch? What color were her eyes? The biggest shock was not what happened, but the ruthless speed with which the big kids turned it into punchlines, so perfect, so hilarious with malice. Was anyone our age so cynical? I was too young to understand the wisdom of that instinctive hardening of heart in self-defense against the kind of world where it was clear that no one was in charge, where even heroes did their best and failed and Krista's blue eyes turned to food for fish. The lens flare that defines the 70s in movies like McCabe and Mrs. Miller was not a fad. The world was like that then, glaring and grainy in the memory as in the canisters of brittle film projected at the Beverly or Arrow revival houses that cannot revive the angel city that I used to live in. Before the malls went up and were torn down, before the Grove and Third Street Promenade seceded from the city to afford a stylish sanctuary to the rich, where they could visit anthropology without the fear of getting asked for change. Mm -hmm. A Saturday meant browsing Westwood Village, its five competing bookshops used and new, and always leaving time for the arcade where I would shovel quarters in Galaga this was the long interregnum of freeways after the red car trolleys were removed and long before the building of the subway, 
when going anywhere involved an hour of sitting in companionable traffic, whose idling roar and smell of burning gas combined to make my childhood's microclimate, which better mufflers and improved AC have rendered as outmoded as the smog, the bowl of mountains disappeared beneath each summer in a brown polluted smudge, which you could smell and taste on certain days when the alert went out to stay indoors. Now, when I drive down Wilshire Boulevard, its few remaining boogie diners lost amid the coffee beans and ATMs, I see the city not as it's become, but as I like to misremember it. Everything cheaper, dirtier, and better, discolored by the streaks of innocence I must have left behind me when I left. I'll read one more poem. Sitting by the stereo and headphones, browsing through the pile of old LPs I rescued from a never open closet. I gave myself the doubtful education that opera offers and that moralists have warned about against for generations till the later styles of musical rebellion made arias sound as innocent as culture. Because I didn't know this, I knew better. From prostitutes and libertines, I learned the secret of the sweetness of transgression. Love, which I had thought was purely good, benevolent and matrimonial, now showed its other faces. Violetta's orgasmic hymns to folly and desire, delight and cross of the reluctant heart. Donna Elvira's joy in her abjection in being dumped and used and dumped again. Was this what Mrs. Brown had meant to teach that afternoon when bored or unprepared? She played the class a tape of Amadeus, a missionary for the higher things. The lesson took, but not as she intended. A high is nothing but the lowest turned into a kind of decorous abstraction, a voice distended with perversity, the melting tone of something giving way. Thank you for the beautiful reading. We have uh, time for a short Q and A if that's of interest. Y'all want to come back up for maybe a couple of questions? As a, as a group? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to start things off, I have a question, which is what advice would you offer someone beginning to write poetry? Let's grab that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I have to go. Okay, let me I'm the, I'm the oldest, so I'll go first. Um, I, I would sort of look at it in, from two different angles. One is to um, get to know your own language and really get to know it, not, not pretend that you have a language, you know, until you know what it is, your own language, and really um, know everything you can about it, how to make sentences how to reorganize the same ideas and other orders and so everything just everything you can possibly know even if you don't like the language if it's yours then you should know it and then you have to come to terms with it and the other thing is to be as honest as you can at every moment you it's always going to change how honest you can be with yourself but at every moment whether it's a the or an ah whether it's an and or a but and then of course the personal just those things I would say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I would say read a lot. That's the most important thing. You have to read a lot to know to know what you can and, and should do. Thank you. I guess the last question then is does anyone uh, what upcoming readings do you all have that we can look forward to? Anything on the agenda? I'm here from New York, so uh, I might be doing something there, and maybe in Los Angeles where these poems are set in the fall. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you thank so you. much. Let's thank give it a applause. Thank you everybody for coming. We have some books for sale over here. Poets will be signing books. If everyone could please help move your chairs up against the wall, I would be grateful.